Welcome, beloved sibling. It is I, Aaron Freeman, not a scientist, but a sciencey optimist. Today, talking to one of my dearest brain buddies, Professor Lise Elliott of Rosalind Franklin Medical School and uh, Rosalind Franklin University. Mm -hmm. Delighted to see you. This particular chat uh, was occasioned by your poster. Mm -hmm. uh, just tell us quickly what your poster was about the, uh, that you were chatting about the other day. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, the title of the poster was Time to Dump the Dimorphism. Uh, men and women's brains are far more similar than different across multiple measures of structure and function. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that, yeah. whatever would fit in the uh, title bar. I met you because of your other, uh, your second book, I guess mm -hmm. it was, uh, Pink Brain, Blue Brain. Mm -hmm. What interests me is that you do your, the currently, this current bit of science you're doing, has an agenda. You are trying to make, have an effect in the world. And yeah, what, what I guess so. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I'm finally comfortable saying that brain sex is a political issue and that um, people have been trying to analyze sex differences in the brain since the time of, well, Aristotle's the first that I'm aware of who wrote about women's inferiority. And it always is all, it's always to illustrate women's inferiority. And any time uh, differences in the brain are evoked by, uh, you know, authoritative scientists, one of my favorite examples being neurologist Charles Dana, who um, the illustrious Dana the Dana, Foundation yes, that I was about to is, say, yes. is uh, uh, named after, and not, not to take anything away from this very noble foundation, but um, he was a neurologist 100 years ago, and uh, as was typical for his day, um, was pretty convinced of women's intellectual inferiority, and given that we were on the verge of trying to um, enact women's suffrage in the U.S. and around the world, um, he was invited by the anti-suffrage union to write a letter to the New York Times, or his letter to the suffrage union, anti-suffrage union was published by the New York Times, um, laying out the basis of women's um, incapacity to reason sufficiently to, to vote, well. given that um, you know our spinal cords are, are narrower than men's and. Uh, he had something about the anterior or posterior activation of the brain, which was actually opposite of what we think today, but uh, all of that rendered women, um, you know, incapable of making rational judgment. But now what you say makes complete and total sense. It certainly, and certainly lots of science has been used to less than holy noble ends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> less than yeah. holy noble. Nonetheless, you are, as, I as I've known you these years, you are reluctant to, as you say, you, now you're going to, you're more than you're sort of come willing to of come out. Yeah, yeah, come out of the closet. Right. As a feminist, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to whence derives the reluctance. Well, you get labeled, labeled an activist very quickly if you try to um, recruit scientific data to support um, a social end that is perceived on the left end of the spectrum. I do feel like I stumbled upon this empirically, that I really did set out to write my book, Pink Brain, Blue Brain, to explain to parents, as I was at the, at the time, a parent of young children whose boys and girls were playing differently, and I perceived to be so different like 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 many parents so i started writing my book pink brain blue brain um you know scouring the literature which you know this was 10 15 years ago so there was less brain imaging of young children there still is not that much of very young children compared to adults but um was uh, really unimpressed with what we supposedly knew about the difference between boys and girls brains basically i came up empty-handed there is nothing we understand today about male structure or function in, in newborns or one-year-olds or two-year-olds that would explain why boys are playing more with trucks and girls more with dolls. I mean, that doesn't mean there's not some difference in the brain, but it's got to be pretty darn subtle. And I presume it's also quite sensitive to environmental learning, which, you know, all of our adults... And we are Huey social animals. Right. So then I started taking a more critical look at the adult brain imaging literature, which I thought was more nailed down. But um, here we are in 2018, people are doing uh, MRI and now functional MRI for, you know, we're in our third decade of this. And you would have thought, after all these thousands and thousands and thousands of brain scans, 
we would have a pretty clear picture of what this alleged thing, if it was a male there. brain yeah. and a female brain is, which most people believe in. I mean, certainly non-scientists absolutely believe there is such a thing as a male brain and a female brain. They read about it every day in women's magazines and men's magazines. Um, I mean, it's used in a casual way, but, but I think that using the word brain when they really mean men and women behave differently uh, gives this essence of biological fixedness, that it's wired into our chromosomes and especially our hormones, and that, you know, the organ in my head is as different from the organ in your head as our reproductive organs. And that really just isn't the case by any measure of brain structure or function. Um, and so what I've, what I've been working on, really doing this massive assembly of, of all the data we've got on structure and function. Because that was the, the, your poster was a meta-analysis that you had done yeah. on a whole lot right. of studies. I think of it more as a meta-synthesis I mean, because it's, it's, I start from meta-analyses and then oh. I, I compare across them. And um, there's, there's almost you know, no two findings that are the same. Or if, if you know, a plurality of studies are, are finding uh, the same sorts of differences between men and women. They are all very small effect sizes, so less than two tenths of a standard deviation, which is sort of the marker for a statistically small effect. Um, and also that you, know, you can um, you can the better way to analyze the contribution of sex to brain structure or function is to parse out the degree of variance that you can attribute to, to, Gender, to, to sex. sex. Right, sex. So uh, neuroimagers are doing all that. You know, um, A good degree of brain structure variance uh, is attributable to age. <laughs> so our brains... As I'm learning to my, yes. my great sadness. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> our brains look a lot different when we're children, when we're adolescents, when we're young adults, and alas... But let me ask you, so... Most of us non-scientists think that there are different, there are male brains and female brains. We're wrong. Okay, what's the problem? What's the, what's the harm here? Well, um, I think it's pretty harmful to uh, invoke any kind of you know intrinsic, um, you know, hardwired differences. So this idea that um, you know we're born with. Uh, by a biology that will limit the way that we can think and the way that we can feel uh, really cuts short boys and girls and it, it cuts short what we know to be men and women's true potential which is a lot more overlap than difference and particularly um, a lot more variance within gender so any of these measures of masculinity and femininity you know, a tendency towards warmth or a tendency towards assertiveness or aggression or empathy. All of those measures can be shown to vary much, much more within sure. the group of males and a group of females than the difference between them. And so um, I think by evoking this term male brain or female brain, and especially the term sexual dimorphism, which that was the title of my poster, right. dump the dimorphism, which is very, you know, Sciencey way sounds really good. It, Dimorphism. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's sounds, good stuff. It sounds much more rigorous and just scientific and evolutionary. Um, dimorphism: two shapes, an ovary, a testes. You right, know, right. that's dimorphic. Our our brains are not dimorphic. Our hearts and our livers and our lungs are not dimorphic. But there are also educational and eco or there are economic implications to the this belief in dimorphism, right? Well, um, yeah. Well, you mentioned. I know that at, at the on the bottom right hand corner of your poster was the dreaded James Damore. But yeah. that that speaks to his his work, his his, uh, his <coughs> letter, his note, and his his ideas speak to some of the economic implications of this belief in dimorphism. Right. So um, obviously, men and women do different jobs on average. In fact careers are strikingly gender segregated, much more gender segregated than you would predict based on the cognitive and emotional and you know non-cognitive abilities that, that they depend on, social abilities and so on. Um, and so um, why is engineering so predominantly male? 85% of 
engineering majors and 85% of Silicon Valley engineers are male. And um, a huge percentage of the tenured professors in physics, math, uh, at big, big universities are men. And I should add a huge percentage of the tenured professors in philosophy, <laughs> sociology, even in the humanities. Uh, men continue to dominate in most many of these fields, at least at big name universities. So you know, the, the higher the prestige, the more um, you know impenetrable the upper ranks are to women. Uh, Fortune 500 companies, you know, there's only 25 out of 500 that are led by women. So, and that has nothing to do with math per se or right. STEM. I mean, being a CEO, one would argue, depends much more on interpersonal skills and organizational skills, which at least at the age of 14, most girls are surpassing boys on, and even well into one's 20s. So, you know, the idea that um, careers are um, that we that we parse out into careers based on our intrinsic abilities um, is just you know pretty darn inaccurate. The incorrect beliefs that we have about sexual dimorphism ripple out. So there there are these kind of social strongly held and without any justification but strongly held because we kind of have this sense that that and that they 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 fan out into other spheres of life you mm -hmm. start with the kind of assumptions uh, we, we have social assumptions mm -hmm. and then it shows up in in economics and education and careers and that is what you hope your work will help to address the words we use are important the words that we use to describe uh, biological phenomena influence the way we think about ourselves and our society and our groups of people. Using a term that exaggerates differences, it really it takes something that is literally, you know, one percent differences in the volume of the amygdala um, and turns it into two shapes. Male, there's a male amygdala and a female amygdala. Never mind that they're really about one percent different. By calling them different organs, we um, we perpetuate this notion that that men and women's brains and and overall abilities are fundamentally different, or steered towards better, steered steered in different directions. And so that's going to bias hiring managers, and it's going to affect uh, you know minorities when women are one in ten in the room. Uh, you know, it evokes this stereotype threat where you start questioning your own abilities, and that you know when you feel like you don't belong there. Um, and and then, of course, just strictly apart from the the uh, you know gender expectations, you have um, a culture that develops when it's 90% male versus uh, equal that is going to be um, suppressing a female advancement. When we were at your poster, a young man came over, looked at it. Ah, so this is a feminist neuroscience. <laughs> yeah. Is what you do feminist neuroscience? Is that fair? Call it. I used to be uncomfortable with that term just because, again, feminist uh, assumes an agenda, but... Man-hating, hairy-legged... Right. <laughs> Synonym with lesbian, too. No, I, that's I forgot know. about that. Yeah, yes. right. Yeah. <clears throat> but... Um, but there is a whole group of feminist biologists now who, and it started with um, with some primatologists. Uh, Sarah Bluffer Hurdy was one of the first who um, tried to correct this notion of um, primate societies as being all about aggression and harems, and appreciated that there was quite a bit of dominance competition among females, and that often the female rank was the most important thing in a in a society. Um, that females can suppress each other's ovulation. There's a lot of competition among females, as well as the idea that um, we breed. We don't necessarily raise our young as as um, isolated suburban housewives in a 1950s kitchen, feeding the baby in the high chair. That in most societies, most you know pre-industrial societies, there's more of a cooperative, what they call cooperative breeding. That it takes a village. And it's not just the mother, it's the grandmother, it's the neighbor, it's the sister uh, who, who participates in the child rearing. So just deconstructing some of our assumptions about, um, about biology and social relations that because they were all framed by a masculinist 
biology. I mean, all of biology was shaped, if you will, evolutionary biology, especially the stuff on sexual selection and the notions of sexual dimorphism, by men who had this this single-minded focus on male competition. When they looked at sexual behavior, all they could see was the rams rutting over <laughs> to compete, and the females were just these passive, you know, uh, receptacles of whoever. They're the prize. Yeah, whoever won. <laughs> right. But that's not true at all. I mean, there's so much growing evidence about you know, the females running off and finding superior uh, sperm when the when the oh yeah pair, when or, they, or rejecting the sperm of males that they don't like the right. chim- there's evidence that chimpanzee females can just reject sperm all right so you've been at this uh, so you wrote the book of what 15 years ago of 10 yeah. 10 years mm-hmm. ago how's that working out for you <laughs> <laughs> well I, mean, I think it's had some some uh, impact um, uh, I think it is still uh, an uphill battle with scientists much less the public um, about um, disabusing this, them of this idea of a male brain and a female brain because unfortunately we have a countervailing um, movement in neuroscience in, in, in biomedical research that has been um, really pushing the notion of studying male and female animals so um, and it is true that in what we call pre preclinical research, so research on, on animals that are models for human disease, um, many of the paradigms were based on largely on male animals because it was thought that, well, they don't have an estrus cycle, it's a simpler system. And then also once you just start developing uh, a paradigm, it, it just, you want to stick with as few variables sure, as absolutely. you can. And um, so a movement started up in the last few years suggest, you know, pushing for this idea that, you know, we're discriminating, there's bias against female animals, there's a New York Times uh, editorial about the bias against female animals. Well, there's there's the Northwestern University has a whole department that, uh, whose job it is to make sure, and and NIH, I I believe the NIH, to get an NIH grant now, you have to include uh, equally in your your experiment test subjects, male and female, mice and monkeys at all. So, What will real progress look like to Lisa Elliott, Dr. Lisa Elliott? <laughs> in gender? Well, um, I think that the people who are really looking closely at this are appreciating that um, gender is fluid, for one thing. I We're, think we got that. A lot of us have got that. Society is showing, but I think it's. I think people are, are starting to accept that that's probably the way our brains work as well. That uh, well, there was a paper um, three years ago by Daphna Joel and colleagues uh, out of Israel called the Human Brain Mosaic, suggesting that um, even if individual features, this one, these one percent differences, are present, they're not present uniformly in every man and every woman's brain. So of 150 features that may be slightly more masculine or slightly more feminine, any individual was going to have just a subset of those and your subset is not going to be different the same as another man's right. subset and similarly among the women and and so there really is just a, a spectrum it's really just a schmear gender is is absolutely a spectrum and that's quite distinct from sex which is largely although not absolutely binary but so i think the answer that you gave to my question has something to do with the number of papers that are published that you, for you one measure of success would be if there were more papers published demonstrating the spectrum of sex itself mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. spectrum of as you say within sexes within men and with, with it would so for you as an academic papers published well one measure of success here's one measure of success would be if the people who are analyzing for sex, which they do in every single human brain imaging study, they have to use sex as a covariate. And they can determine quantitatively how much is sex to contributing to the variance in this sample. And like I said, it's typically about 1%. If they would just publish that instead of instead of just say we, you know, we we uh, balanced for gender or we covaried for gender, just publish the number. Show us how small those values are. Instead, what happens is they anal- people analyze for gender. If they don't find a significant difference, 
they don't publish it. And so there was a nice study uh, that came out this year out of um, by a first author named Sean David out of Johnny e. Winiti's lab at Stanford that actually demonstrated that there's serious publication bias in the literature on functional brain imaging for sex. So out, out of 179 studies of uh, sex difference in sex differences in human brain activation. Um, the larger studies found very little or no difference. It was only these small studies that right. found differences, which you can interpret as statistical evidence for publication bias. Those are probably false positives that got managed to get through peer review, um, whereas you know, an equal number of studies, we presume, where people didn't find a difference they didn't bother submitting for publication because we we knew nobody no editor would bother to take it. So part of this is an open science issue and, and if you're aware of the open science movement yes. that all data is good data. All da all data deserves to be free and published instead of just, you know, increasing the sample size until you get significance, which is really unkosher but unfortunately um, has been common practice for a long time and so you know if um, if uh, if you analyze your data at the end of the experiment you've already published your study of um, you know brain processing to language you got a nice little publication about which areas of the brain are activated then you go back and reanalyze it for sex or gender and if you find a difference bingo paper number two if you don't find a difference Okay, let's move on to the next study. Um, so you, so you, one of the things you like to see is within the academy a difference, a a, a, a a change in how data gets treated and which data gets published. All data should be published, all. even if it's not sexy. Uh, it should still be accessible so that people who want to know the real magnitude of an effect can see all of the data. I mean, this has been an issue in drug trials for a long time. Um, you know, the some of the early studies of uh, SSRIs for depression, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, it was demonstrated that the negative data were not being published by drug companies, and so we had this biased perce perception of the efficacy. And so that, we're according to the NIH, or the FDA, you know, if you're going to do a trial, you register it, you publish it, no matter what. And I don't know how compliant the drug companies are, but that's the model for how we get to real answers. I, I really appreciate that. That's a great place to end up here. But, but uh, I appreciate your time. But I want to ask one other little area. Stick our toe in one little area, okay. because what you say points to an interesting phenomenon in science, which is that a lot of people are questioning the criteria for publication in scientific journals mm -hmm. and the efficacy of peer review, mm -hmm. which tends, which could, could could diminish public confidence in science at a time when we really need, yeah, yeah. need like, right. and so that and, and that and you are saying this as well. You're saying yeah. that the, that the the stuff that we're reading. Mm -hmm is reflective of bias at least and agendas at worst. Mm -hmm. So aren't you, is it possible to say that what that you, your very work is contributing to the lack of public respect for science? On anti-science, yeah. Yeah. Well, it is a concern, um, but, um, you know, the genie's out of the box. We already know. Genie's out of the bottle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we already, okay. whatever. Yeah. Uh, we already know that um, that these practices are happening, and uh, it, it's quite interesting for me to watch a generational change in science. And the younger generation is totally into this open science. Pre-register your studies. Report the data. We'll clean it up. We'll get it right, and it'll ultimately it'll save a lot of time and effort and taxpayer dollars when we can pursue the real truth and not chase things that were a result of, of bias. Now for the peer review that you're talking about, that's a, that's a little different issue and I think we are definitely appreciating the weaknesses of peer review. Um, you know, just to have two or maybe three reviewers on one publication, it, it, it seems Horribly weak in an that. era. I was what we you know the, one of the the um, 
look, they'll, 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 several times people sent the same paper to different groups of reviewers and half of them will say yeah. published and half will say this is rubbish right <laughs> absolutely i mean peer review is a crapshoot there is no question that it's just the luck of the draw and you know you're allowed to nominate your own reviewers which is helpful to editors they want to find people with expertise and they don't only take the reviewers that the author recommends but nonetheless you know you're going to get at least one friendly uh, reviewer so the idea that we would leave uh, this decision about the quality of a paper up to two or three scientists would be like uh, you know a, a film company a, a major studio screening a, a movie with two or three people no what do they do they put a focus group with a thousand or many hundred people in the room and they get a decent uh, response rate and similarly I think that the open uh, publication movement is going in that direction where we have you know post publication peer review essentially where anybody can comment on a paper and if you have expertise that should be apparent from the quality of your open review and if you don't know what the hell you're talking about it, that should be apparent too and and so the true um, critiques will rise to the top and will get uh, a better assessment well I wouldn't have it any other, any other way than to have my buddy Lise Elliott out there in the front lines working for justice <laughs> and using science as a tool to fight oppression and wrongdoing uh, I hope so thanks thank you really very much fun Lise. to talk to you it's fun to talk to you all right <laughs> thank you very much for watching we are the Chicago Brain Buddies every Thursday we are on uh, uh, Facebook live and and you can listen to our podcast anytime you want on a podcast platform of your choice. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening.